Björn, great to have you on. Uh, really, really fantastic. Uh, uh, not so many um, international uh, Norwegian CEOs, so uh, uh, really great. Now, you guys make like 400 million pair of shoes a year. What do you What do you wear today? What, what, what Which ones have you got on? I have uh, Samba. Samba. Would you mind just taking it off and we can have a look at it? <laughs> but only the shoes. I don't take any other things off. Right? Shoes are fine. Shoes are fine. We'll, we'll start with we we'll start with the shoes. Why? Um, so why do you why do you wear Samba? Um, it's accident now, but Samba is actually the coolest shoe in the marketplace now. Uh, it's an old shoe that came out of uh, soccer, football. Um, and um, over the last six months, it's developed into be probably the hottest street shoe around the world. So uh, demand is much bigger than supply. And, you know, I'm an old guy, so I'm trying to get young. So I dress like the kids do. And that's why I'm wearing the summer. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm trying to say it, but it doesn't quite work so well for me. Um, but um, <laughs> So when you look at a shoe, what do you look at? What, what makes a good shoe? Well, that depends on what it's for. I mean, it's a, if it's a performance shoe, then I have to wear it and test it. And I'm testing a lot of shoes. Um, and when it gets to the fashion side of it, um, you know, I'm more mainstream. So I follow what uh, I see the trendsetters are wearing and, uh, and my trend people give me shoes. I wear, I wear what they tell me. Uh, but on performance, if it's a running shoe or a soccer shoe, or, um, I, I test a lot of shoes to see what fits me. So let's say you do a running shoe. What kind of what kind of things do you look at? What do you when you run with a running shoe? What what are the things you are uh, conscious about? Well, for me, uh, I mean, being an old soccer player with an artificial knee, I need stability and cushioning. So it needs to be a shoe with a wide sole, a wide last, um, and with I would say extra Nordic cushioning. So I'm, I'm looking for a, yeah, a shoe that fits me. Um, and then if I run a 5K and I try to be fast, which I do a couple of times a year, then I run with a shoe that has a carbon plate, um, I will, and which is very light that actually makes you run faster. You know? So it depends on, on what I'm using it for. But um, I'm very particular when it gets to the footwear I, I, I wear for sport. Uh, then uh, I spend quite some time testing till I find out what is the best. Mm. Now, you have a background as a professional athlete. Uh, tell us about that journey. Well, I'm born uh, with a father that was a national player, both in, in football and in handball, for those of you who know what that is. So I grew up in a, in a sports home and, and had only one passion, that was sports. Um, so I also played both handball and, and, and football on the, on the Premier League uh, in, in Norway, also all the youth national teams. Um, and then I turned professional and went to Nuremberg when I was 18 um, and then injured myself badly and, and uh, had many uh, surgeries. So, so I had to give up my career when I was 23. Um, uh, and that's why I had to move my skills from the legs into the head, you know, and, and um, started studying and, and um, then connecting to the sports industry. But I think you've said somewhere that you got a, you got a bachelor's, you got a master's, but the, the best education you have is your team sport. What, what do you mean by that? Well, playing team sports at any level, but especially at the professional level, is um, is like um, it mirrors a little bit of life. You play with people that are better than you, worse than you, people you like that you don't like, <clears throat> but you have to try to to give the biggest impact that you can on a team, not only for yourself but the team as a total. And and I think that mirrors what you're trying to do in a job. Um, you, you know, uh, and and that's why from a Education point of view, you know, being an athlete uh, that played in different teams um, and then also going through the, the phase of being injured and, and how you deal with problems and, and not only wins, but also losses. It's, it's been the best lesson that um, that I've taken with me in my professional career. The, the education only gives you a background to, to have kind of the, the knowledge theoretically, but uh, real life experience is a thousand times better than education. Mm. Now, in sports, to go from one um, club to another is uh, it's a pretty big thing. And uh, you went from uh, from Puma to to Adidas <laughs> now. Uh, that's a big thing. <laughs> yeah. How, how, uh, how did that shift come about? Well, first, you have to remember that I spent 10 years with Adi in the 90s. So this is like coming home. Uh, so uh, it's not as bad as only going from Puma to Adidas. I, I, I have, haven't been with Adidas before, but... This time, after having been the CEO for Puma for 10 years, uh, I felt that extending another five years would not be right. Uh, I mean, 15 years on the helmet uh, of Puma, in my opinion, would have been too long. Um, 
And I think I was in a phase where head and heart uh, was going in different directions on many decisions, and I, I felt it was time. Um, I had decided to leave and go to a, a different company, and then suddenly Adi showed up uh, with you know, their CEO leaving, and, and, uh, and they then asking me a couple of times if I could um, join. Um, I thought I had a non-compete, so the answer in the beginning was no. Uh, but when we then checked the contract and figured out I didn't really have a non-compete, the door was open and then um, I took the step. Um, emotionally, a little bit difficult, uh, but um, the right decision, I think, for everybody. I think for Puma, for Adi and for me. Now, you wear only uh, Adidas uh, clothes for the moment. What what are you done with all your Puma clothes? <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's not only mine. I have three sons uh, who has been in Puma for 10 years. I have a wife um, and, and also extended family that has only one Puma. So um, I tell you, there was a lot of product. Uh, but what we did is that uh, we gave uh, um, everything to different organizations and then to our kids who could give it to their friends. So now when all the friends of my kids come to our house, they all wear Puma, which I don't really like, but <laughs> I'm, I'm guilty of it. So... So I think we gave away, I would say, 90% of the, of the product we had to people who needed it. Mm-hmm. Now, the story, uh, the kind of the rivalry between Puma and Adidas is a pretty fascinating one, right? You're both in a small village. It came from two brothers who competed. Just uh, give, us a, give us a quickie on that one. Well, it comes from the father. I mean, it was the Dustler, uh, you know, back in the 40s who had a shoe factory. And then the two brothers, um, you know, uh, started working for him. Uh, and then during and after the Second World War, um, they uh, didn't find together uh, as friends anymore and they separated. So uh, uh, Puma was founded in 48 and Adi in 49. Um, and since then, they were big competitors. Um, and I think the interesting thing is that in this small little dwarf, as you call it, Herzog and Aurach, um, the pro- professional sports industry was actually born. Huh? So if you look back to everything that happened in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, it was basically Adi competing against Puma. And as, as you said, they were two brothers and very emotional and very, very many stories, of course, uh, what that did to this small dwarf. Um, many actually funny stories, but also bad stories. Um, and then only later, you know, the Americans with Nike and Reebok and other brands came on. But this is where the sports industry was founded. And, um, and I happen to be so lucky that I've been the boss of both. Um, I'm not sure what the, what the dustlers think about me. But, um, uh, you know, um, it's, a, it's a, what should I say, big thing to have experienced. And I'm actually very proud of that. Mm. So Dorf is a German word for, for village, right? So do you, do you kind of do the Adidas people and the Puma people go on different sides of the streets or uh, like how, <laughs> like how split is, is you eat, do you eat in the same restaurants or are you like, uh, how does it split the village? I, it used to be very split. So, uh, you know, it was a river that split between Puma and Adi and it was, as I said, um, uh, very serious. Uh, and there's many bad stories about that, actually. I think today it's different. Um, you know, we, we uh, have about, Five and a half thousand people here. I think uh, Puma around fifteen hundred. Uh, and ironically, many of those have partners working for the other brands. So it's 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 not as tense as it used to be. And uh, and you know, to be very honest with you, I'll rather have uh, Puma uh, be successful um, than an American company. So as as competitive as we are, I think we are friendly competitor. And and when I was at Puma, I was also very close friends with many people at Audi. So. I, I think the stories are better than reality, to be honest. It's um, it's now kind of common sense and we all behave uh, like people should be with respect. And, and as I said, many of us are friends. Yeah, yeah. Well, if we if we look at the reality, um, Adidas, before you took over, had some difficult years. And actually, yeah. when you when you took the... When you took the job, the, the share price went up by 30%. And I think some people call it the, the golden opportunity after your uh, surname. So So what happened during those years? Oh, it's a long decision, a long uh, story. I, I think that Adi had everything going for them, you know, through the 17, 18, 19. Uh, and then I think, uh, you know, COVID and, and a lot of things that changed the world didn't really fit, um, I would say, the strategy. And, and I think Adi was uh, slow in, in, in reacting to these changes. You know, China going down, COVID, uh, the Russian war. Um, and and the whole, what should I say, D2C going straight to the consumer uh, on a very aggressive sales plan and also a, 
I would say aggressive profit plan didn't really fit the landscape. Um, then you lost, you know, the cooperation with uh, Kanye West, the Yeezy business. And so there were many things that happened at once that, uh, that then took the company in a, in a difficult path. Um, and, and I think they lost focus. Um, uh, my job is to bring back the old Audi DNA, which is, you know, to be the best sports brand, um, you know, to mirror performance with street culture um, and, and be very, very focused on product marketing and the consumer. And that's what we're trying. Um, and as you know, uh, on PowerPoint, everything is, um, is easy, but, you know, we deal with people and it will take a little bit of time. But uh, I think we already now see that we're on the right track and I'm, I'm extremely optimistic about our midterm. Mm. So let's advise to people who take over a company like that. What's the first thing you do when you get a new job? Um, I think, I mean, by me and art is a little bit different because as you know, I've been here before and I followed the industry my whole life and I'm a, I'm a sports romantic. So, uh, you know, uh, I think I knew the, 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 the company from the outside very well. And then of course the industry, but I think in general, um, you know, most businesses are people business. So uh, when you look at all the numbers, which you, of course, have to do, um, um, you also then need to look at the people and find uh, out very quickly who the key people are that you can trust and, and, and then form your team. And then, you know, together with the team, uh, start to attack the issues. Um, uh, I, I think that everything which is consumer oriented is extremely dependent on the people. And, and that's why I always say that my biggest role as a leader and coach is, is uh, actually HR. I mean, to, to, to work with the people, that's the most important thing. Bjorn, what's the, what's the key to build a strong sports brand? Oh, I mean, first of all, you need to make sure you have the right product on the performance side. So you have the right, um, you know, technologies and, and the products so people can actually perform. Um, right now, uh, as you can see, you know, we had the right product coming out of the Women's World Cup, which we won with Spain. That's why I'm wearing the women's shirt for Spain. That's good. Um, if you have running shoes, you need to make sure that you have the best technology there and so forth. Um, and then, of course, you need to um, have um, athletes and teams and federation who gives you the exposure. And then to make money, you need to translate that into lifestyle. Uh, you know, the lifestyle market and the street market is much bigger than the sports sports markets. So you need to combine both. Um, and there you need to connect to the what we call street culture, you know, connect to whatever the, what should I say, young people uh, around the world thinks is relevant, uh, both from a direction on the product, but also working with influencers and, and entertainers um, and people that are relevant for that consumer group. So it's a... Um, it's, it's like it mirrors a lot of what is relevant for people around the world, if you know what I mean. It's like you need to be visible. Uh, you need to have a message that is, what should I say, important uh, and, uh, and relevant. Um, and then you need to be very close to consumer demand uh, and changes in, in, in demand. So it's a, it's, I always say that everything we do in sports and culture is relevant all over the world. So we need to be on the, on the what should I say, the... the the, the things that are happening around the world to be part of it. And, um, and that's why this industry is so interesting. How do, you, how, do you, how do you pick these ambassadors and, and athletes? Well, uh, mostly by, of course, following the advice of the people in the markets um, and, uh, and be very close to what is going on. Um, in sports, it's, of course, to try to pick the athletes, female or male, that are the best, but also have a personality. Uh, when it gets to influencers um, uh, in general, it is to find out who has an impact in the different markets. That might be very local. I mean, it might be, a, what should I say, a pop brand in Korea or it might be a designer in Sweden. Um, and, and there are many, many, what should I say, variables. Um, but the key of them is to listen to your people and listen to your consumer. Um, you cannot decide what is relevant for the consumer you need to pick up trends and then commercialize it. So you need to be very, very close to the markets. Mm. But sometimes um, the disadvantage of going with um, with the big names is that sometimes they become very dominant. And you kind of had this issue with uh, with uh, Kanye West. So so what happened there? Well, this is before my time. I think Kanye West is one of the most creative people in the world, um, and uh, you know, both in music and, and what I will call street culture. So he is extremely creative and has, together with Adi, uh, you know, created a Yeezy line, which was very successful. Um, 
And then as creative people, you know, he did some statements which wasn't that good and, and that caused Adi to break the contract and withdraw the product. Very unfortunate because um, I don't think he meant what he said and, and I don't think he's a bad person. It just came across that way. And that meant we lost that business. You know, one of the most successful collabs in the in the in the history uh, very sad um, but again uh, you know when you work with third parties that could happen um, and uh, you know it's it's part of part of the game that can happen with an athlete it can happen with an entertainer um, so it's it's part of the business yeah we are seeing it in many industries we are seeing it in the spirits business with uh, tequila vodka and so on as well <laughs> No comparison. I don't think tequila, I don't know. <laughs> um, what are the technological trends that you're seeing which you are excited about in in your industry? Well, the product side is, it is of course, on the running side, it's been lighter materials and it's been this famous carbon plate that you put in the midsole that actually triggers you to run forward. So the shoe itself has some energy. That's why... You know, both on spike shoes and running shoes, you see that times are improving because of technology, um, lighter materials. Um, and then you will see and are starting to see a lot of sustainable materials, um, you know, materials that <clears throat> doesn't come out of oil or, or anything that damage um, the, the, the planet. Uh, so a lot of innovation on that side. And then when it gets to innovation in general, you know, when it gets around those, uh, then, of course, the whole digital space, um, you know, e-com from a channel, you know, which 15 years ago didn't exist, has been huge. And also, um, you know, digital tools uh, like artificial intelligence um, and all kinds of simulation tools that we can use to help um, um, us run uh, and improve the business. Um, but in the core core of it, it's everything that has to do with materials and the product itself. Um, that uh, that is mostly important for us, to be honest. Mm. How do you use AI? Oh, it takes over um, a lot of functionalities where we used to have a lot of people. I mean, writing product text, for example, making sure we optimize pages, uh, that we optimize uh, marketing tools. Uh, and then it's also starting to, uh, what should I say, uh, be taking decision making product when it gets to product launches um, volumes but 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 you can't use only artificial intelligence that uh, when you when you do that you also need to use a little bit your 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 human intelligence so it's a combination it's a it's a tool that can uh, make yourself much more efficient uh, and take subjectivity out of many decisions uh, and it can also do a lot of i would say repetitive tasks in a better way um, and save both time um, and, of course, uh, cost. Mm. Now, in sports, but also in uh, business, uh, speed speed is a mindset. And um, and you say that speed is becoming more and more important. Why, why is that important? Well, first of all, because things change very quickly. Um, as I said, over the last three years, we've had a pandemic, which, uh, you know, none of us have experienced and none of us learned in school or in life how to deal with. So uh, I think speed and flexibility was uh, enormously important then. Um, then you had, you know, the fright craze crisis in the sense that, you know, both supply chains um, got 10 times more expensive and certain producing markets uh, shut down. So, so your whole supply chain was was changing. Um, and then you had markets, you know, that were shut down because of COVID or other reasons. So, you know, the speed uh, to have an organization that to see what's going on and then can react is more crucial than ever. And, and I always say that when the reality surpasses your plan, your plan is not relevant anymore. So uh, it's extremely important um, uh, with speed and, and having both people and processes that, um, that can take decisions um, based on, 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 on facts and also a certain degree of intuition. And how do you get the speed up in an organization? People. And how do you, um, how do you, and, how do, you do that? Of course, it's, 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 uh, I, I, these are the many different opinions about this, but I, I believe in a more decentral organization because I think markets uh, move in different uh, phases. Um, the differences between China and the Western world, for example, on consumer taste and, and, and things has become much bigger. The differences between US and Europe has become bigger. So you need to make sure that you work in a matrix um, that is more locally focused than the old, what should I say, hierarchical central organization. Um, 
and then give people the tools um, and the feeling that they can make decisions. Uh, and, and ironically, with all the tools you have, people get even more important in a, in a, in a, in a, in a situation like that. So, so I, I, I look at um, the organization as, a, as an organic thing that changes all the time, that is multi-dimensional um, and will always be in a matrix. And, and in this industry, you need social intelligent people that, that are able to move in a matrix and, and can actually, um, what should I say, make decisions or, or, or help in decisions without having a one-dimensional hierarchy. Um, if you are a person that needs only one reporting line and, and very, very clear defined uh, roles that you have uh, in this industry, and I think consumer product in general is not where you should be. Um, but Bjorn, isn't this slightly at odds with with German corporate culture? Because <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not joking. But I mean, speed. You talk about speed and agility. When I talk, when I think about German corporate culture, I think about Ordnung, hierarchy, uh, process, systems. Yeah, but you have to remember here. I'm sitting in Germany, but I have 120 nationalities on campus, um, and I'm trading in 160 different countries and. I say that uh, the office here in Germany, the office we have in LA and Portland in the US and in Shanghai, the sum of those four offices is headquarters. So I, I don't look upon this as being only one headquarter. And since the headquarter officially sits in Germany, we are a German company. Um, we are a global company that happen to have roots in Germany, but we're not a German company. Um, so I think that would be the answer. Do you make fast decisions? Very. Is that good? <laughs> yes. Are you, <laughs> not are, you, <laughs> are, you too, are you too fast sometimes? Yeah. Yeah, I am. So what's the what's the advantages and, and disadvantages of being fast versus well, process oriented? I, I think the advantage is if you have a leader that is on on, on par with the, with what's going on and, and you have, you know, your 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 people around you, you together can make fast decisions. Uh, of course, the problem in the beginning is that if you have a leader like me who, who gets very much involved in the beginning, you could you know, make people uncertain because you're pulling a lot of a decision to yourself and that's always a balance. Uh, and and when you make decisions, you're not always right, right? But um, I, I, I always say to people, I'd rather have you make a decision and be wrong than not making a decision and only wait. I don't need people who wait. You know? So, so I, I, I think that making decisions based on the facts that are there um, – and, 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 and certain intuition is better than, you know, asking for another meeting. I hate ending a meeting with another meeting. I, I don't like that. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, when I met you in person, one of the things that really struck me and which I really uh, liked uh, with you is, is the absence of uh, bullshit, you know. Um, uh, very truth-seeking, uh, very honest, very transparent. Why, why, why are these things important? <laughs> Oh, I, th I think that a uh, has to do with personality, but I think also experience. You know, I've been in this industry so long, and, and I've done many mistakes. Uh, and uh, you know, I think I have certain confidence that I'm not afraid. Um, being honest has to do with with also having a certain confidence. You know, I I don't need to act or play something I'm not. I am the way I am, and and uh, that's why uh, I'm I'm never tired of my job because I I I, I can be myself and and. Uh, I, I think that's a huge uh, advantage that you don't have to act, uh, you know, to be something you're not. Uh, most people I know that get into, you know, burnouts and, and having problems are people that think they have to act in a different way than their personality. And I've been very conscious all the time that I am the way I am with the strengths and the weaknesses and, and, and try to make, uh, you know, people understand that um, that they can deal with me. It doesn't matter if you are the lowest on the hierarchy or the highest. Um, I treat everybody the same and, and they can treat me as a as a colleague. Uh, the only time is when hierarchy hierarchy counts is when we disagree. Then I have to decide. Um, mm -hmm. And um, the less decisions I take, uh, the better it is uh, because then it means that someone else has taken the decision that I agree with. Do you think um, this learning from mistakes and uh, seeking the truth, is there a link to sports and to performance culture? Yeah. Uh, I mean, if I can find an ex-athlete, a male or female, that also has, you know, uh, the, the, what should I say, the, 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 fach, what do you call it, um, the education or, or, or is interested in the topic, then I, I, I love to hire them because athletes has, uh, are used to pressure, um, are used to compete, 
Um, and, and that is things that is very, very important also, in at least in our industry. So I love to work with uh, ex-athletes. I had never thought about uh, what you said about uh, burnouts. And it's maybe people who are pretending. What, what, would you mind just elaborating a tiny bit here? No, I, I, I think that, you know, to to act like you are something that you are not, meaning that you go to work and you have to be a different person because you think you need to, to be that uh, cost a lot of uh, energy. Um, and, and I think many people are led into different cultures by believing they have to be different than what they are. And, and, and that's why they get into burnouts. Um, uh, I think if you can act the way you are, of course, serious and, and also with the knowledge, but but you don't need to play a different person. I think you you save a lot of energy and and, um, and life is easier. Um, in, in our jobs, at least in mine, is like it's not really a job; it's a lifestyle. I mean, I I am uh, you know CEO of Adidas twenty four seven, and and I live that role, you know, and and uh, and as long as I feel I can be that with my personality, I will. I will, I will I will do it and, and be that person. Um, if I feel that I don't fit anymore, or, or then then I will quit. Um, because uh, I I think as a leader, when you've done it for a while, um, changing uh, your your way of doing business, um, um, I don't think it works. And and I think your credibility in the organization, when they feel that they can treat you for who you are. Um, makes things much easier. Um, I, so. I heard something about you sharing your personal uh, telephone number with all the employees in the beginning. Yeah. Is that right? Correct. Correct. Yeah. So how many people did you give it to? 60,000. <laughs> how many calls did you get? Um, I mean, calls and text messages and WhatsApp, many. Um, but, but, I, but I think this, I mean... My, my point is that um, they should have access to leadership, um, and if they have something which is important, they should be feeling comfortable going direct. So, I get, um, I would say, you know, a couple of hundred direct messages every week um, that I try to respond to in one shape or form, or I take the topic that they raise and then addresses it in a town hall, uh, and and I, I try to. Um, yeah, I mean, you see from the things that you get directly to yourself what is important for people, and and I try to bake that into the messages that I give back. Uh, I also do town halls for all the sixty thousand um, every month, uh, where we go through the previous month when it gets to performance. We talk about what the issues are, and and at the same time, then take some of those topics that comes up through the direct contact, um, and and uh, and and bring them up. Uh, so it's it's a way of of uh, uh, having people understand they can go straight to the to the boss without having to be afraid of someone else seeing it or or I mean you know how people are. Uh, mm. I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, now, when do you when are you in the flow? When do you thrive the most? When do you feel, gee, I'm so lucky. I'm so lucky. Twenty four seven. It's like. Uh, you know, to be honest, being being the CEO in this company and in this industry um, is amazing. Uh, I just landed from Sydney yesterday, uh, having won with Spain uh, the Women's World Cup, uh, and I'm after this call flying to Budapest to see Carson, although he's in Puma, winning the 400 meter hurdle, um, and and that's part of my job, right? And and. Uh, you know, being in the middle of sport, street culture, fashion, working with, as I said, 120 nationalities on on headquarters, 50% men, 50% women. And um, I, I don't think there's a better job, to be honest. Um, so um, um, I don't know if that's called in the flow, but I'm very happy where I am. Well, I would uh, slightly disagree with you. I, I actually think I have a better job, but uh, hey. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, well, it's true. When you have fun, it's not a job, right? It's just a... Uh... No. Yeah, but you know we are privileged because we gotten there because we have done many things that um, that uh, we thought were fun. I, I don't think you get to the top either in sports or business if you do things you don't like. Uh, I always say that an athlete who are world class has to do ten to twelve, fourteen thousand hours of practice, and you can't do that if you don't think it's fun, you know. And and the criticism on athletes because they only do it for money and all that, that's not true because to get to get the money, you have to love it, you know, and I think it's the same in work, you know, it's like, I mean, you smile and laugh a lot because you like what you do, but you also done a lot of things to get there that uh, that you like, because if not, you wouldn't be there. And uh, I, I, you know, I have all my career done things um, that I enjoyed uh, and uh, 
I, I, I really believe that um, if you don't like your job, you should do something else because um, life is too short to kind of work against your joy, if you know what I mean. Right. You also like skiing. Yep. You just had an accident. Oh, a couple of months ago. Sky Verena, and uh, I crashed and uh, broke my shoulder. Yeah, correct. So what is your attitude to risk? Oh, that's a good one. Um, personal risk, uh, high. <laughs> uh, business risk, I would say average in the sense that um, I, I would not gamble with a business that I don't own, if you know what I mean. I, I act uh, as a CEO of a public company. I act on behalf of the shareholders. So I try to put myself in the in the in the role that I'm 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 actually dealing with your money, and that's why my my risk profile is less on 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 my job than it is private. Mm. What do you read? Very little. Um, I have to be honest with you that I, I I'm not calm enough to sit and read a book, um, and and I much rather be with people, traveling, being at different events. And getting what should I say my lesson and education by being with people than reading uh, text. Um, of course, when I studied, uh, you know, I had to read and and. Um, but lately, I, I I read articles and of course I follow uh, media very closely on the industry and and sports and, and I would say the world in general. But I currently do not read books because I, I can't sit quiet for long enough time. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate you've been sitting so long already. <laughs> no, but now we're speaking, so it's a, it's a dialogue. But reading a book is like, I, I, I tend then to get on my phone or, or watch a little bit what's happening somewhere else. So I'm, I'm not calm enough. What do you the, watch? The what do you watch? Do you watch anything else in sports? News, sports and news, nothing else. Hmm. Why but I have to I have to tell you the book because it's it's um, it's maybe old fashioned. But the book that um, there's two things. First of all, in school, the most important thing I learned is accounting because I think when you know accounting and you do understand how to read a balance sheet or you know if something is expense or capex and what is cash flow and what is PNL, when you do understand those things, no one can bullshit you. So the most important thing, advice I, I say to my kids, uh, even if they're interested in marketing, understand accounting because it's the base for everything. If you don't understand accounting, it's difficult later to understand why things are they were. So that's advice number one. <laughs> advice number two is that I'm so old fashioned that the best book I read was, you know, Philip Kotler, The Basic Principle of Marketing, the four Ps, because they are as relevant as they were then. Uh, and uh, and the four pieces always, when I think about it, the most relevant things when I look at a, a business issue. We call it different things, but uh, I think he boiled it down in, in the four pieces very well. Mm. I think it's interesting because we always ask people, what is your advice to young people? And uh, learning accounting, it's the first time I heard that one. <laughs> I know, but but it's because... It's because when you understand a balance sheet and you understand a PNL, every decision you're then making, you understand the consequence of those. You know, so so it's like uh, it's difficult to bullshit someone that that understands the accounting principles. Uh, and uh, you know, there's many times that marketing or salespeople are getting manipulated by finance people because you know only the finance people knows the consequences. You know, and, and uh, people are always surprised by me that I'm very quick when it gets to the accounting side of it because uh, I learned that very, very properly. Mm. Well, Bjorn, it's been uh, uh, tremendous to have you on. Um, you are doing great things with Adidas. We very much look forward to, to tracking your progress and, uh, and big thanks for, for being on the podcast with us. Take care. You too.